Ray Merrick III of the Horrorsyndicate.com said, There are some good laughs in the movie, but you cannot take it too seriously. According to Janet Maslin of the New York Times, this movie was a series of utterly listless comic setups. And Academy Award winner Gina Davis referred to this movie as a crazy, awful, small movie that we shot in Yugoslavia. On this episode of Ruined Childhoods, we determine the fate of Transylvania 65000. Which one will it be? The Ruined Childhoods Podcast. Greetings, Starfighters, and welcome to Ruined Childhoods, the podcast where I, Dan, talks to my brother John, and we hey, talk that's about. Me. Yeah, hey John, and we talk hey. about movies because that's what we, we like to do. We we really like movies. We like we don't just like movies, but we like the we like the people involved with them, most of them. <laughs> and we like, but we also like, I think we also appreciate the effort of perhaps the lesser esteemed movies, you know? Sure. Well, yeah. I mean, this podcast, we talk a lot about a lot of, I guess, cult movies, movies that uh, aren't considered mainstream successes, but they capture the the hearts of a certain audience, such as this one that we're talking about today. Now, uh, now, question, I suppose, mm-hmm. on that on that note, for it to be a cult film, because I feel like movies like uh, Transylvania 65000, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, are, I wonder how much of a, I wonder how much of the cult around that movie is just kids who had nothing better to do than watch it on HBO repeatedly in the mid 80s. And because I feel like for a cult film, it it kind of has to transcend that. Like a cult film, Harold and Maud is a is a cult film. Generations upon generations kind of fall for it. But I I wonder if some of these movies, Transylvania Six Five Thousand included, would necessarily carry over to a like to a different generation and is that the well, definition of a cult film well i will say in using transylvania 65000 as an example and if you haven't seen the movie we'll go into more about it and i i do encourage you to seek it out and check it out and you can let us know what you think of it but um it, something about it that always strikes me is it's it's very quotable the performances in it are what makes it so enjoyable. And this is a movie that is under the radar that stars some big names, like huge names. I mean, it's a Jeff Goldblum, you know, it's an ensemble film, but he is, you know, right now, especially having such a moment. It's crazy. What's crazy about Jeff Goldblum is like the Zelig of movie stars because you see a movie like Transylvania 6 5000 and I was about to say, I was like, yeah, it's a lot of people on the verge of stardom. But meanwhile, Jeff Goldblum was in Robert Altman's Nashville in what, mm-hmm. 1976 or 1975. Yeah. Um, you know, he has this, like he's featured. I don't think he says anything. If, if, if he just says anything, he doesn't say much, but he rides on this like big, like tricycle motorcycle. Um, right. he's in death wish. <laughs> Yeah, well, that was, I think, his first, maybe. The, the original, the, yeah, that was, um, yeah, earlier in, in the 70s. But this was, this was Buckaroo right Banzai. before, <laughs> well, Buckaroo Banzai, but that's another cult. Yeah. And he, it's not like he was the star of it. He's in the right stuff. But uh, Jeff Goldblum's another he's, one of those actors. He's great in the right stuff. He is great in the right stuff. Uh, he, him and Harry Shearer. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's been such a long time since I've seen that movie. They're great. They're kind of like this comic relief 
do they work for NASA? I, yeah, I feel I, like I think so. Yeah, they're like the recruiters or something, and it's they're really enjoyable. But also, it's like this is right after this is when he started doing movies like The Fly, you know, movies that made him become more of a name. Right. So it's like he still at this point wasn't quite there. When was Vibes? <laughs> Eighty eight. So this is before vibes. This is pre vibes. Anyway, listen, I don't want to get off on this because we're like, I want to, sp- I want to table this tangent because obviously right. we, you know, we have a few things to discuss before we get yeah. to the movie. And it's such well, a, his career, no, I, Jeff Goldblum's career has a lot to do with this movie. Yeah. Well, I, I also do want to say, you mentioned earlier that we, uh, we appreciate movies and especially, the people that put in the blood, sweat and tears to create these movies that sometimes don't get noticed at all. And that's something that I think about a lot when there is a movie that is considered bad or anything. And it's like that aside, this was a, like a lot of people's lives is like maybe over a hundred people, even if it's a small movie, it's like a hundred people's life. An entire Yugoslavian village. <laughs> well, in this case, yeah. In this case. But, you know, and it's like a lot of movies, it's just like, you know, somebody was really excited to like call up their parents and tell them that they got a job on this movie. Yeah. And I, I feel that way. I definitely more towards independence movies that were uh, were were made with a, with a tiny budget or you know had to you know where the directors like Kevin Smith maxing out his credit cards to make clerks yeah. signing up for credit cards and then maxing them out <laughs> to make clerks well it's it's yeah. also the bigger the big movies that maybe turn out not as good because of studio interference and things like that where it's like no matter what people worked really hard on this Yeah. And I always think about that even when a movie is not so good. And I try to think about that. Um, Transiting a 65,000 is definitely an interesting case. Uh, Like you said, an entire village in Yugoslavia kind of was taken over by this movie for a month. Now, Um, before we get to it, because I just have a, I, I, uh, so I watched it this week and I watched it with a commentary track. Me too. I had a feeling. We don't talk about these things, folks. So, Dan, <laughs> I had a bef- feeling, wait, John. <laughs> let's, let's put a pin in Transvinga 65000. Yeah. I have yes. one piece of news and this is kind of like gray area news because this does have to do with an adaptation and... I've gone on record saying that this is not an adaptation podcast, but you know what? It kind of is. It kind of is, though. Yeah. Yeah, because I know you've suggested that certain movies come back as stage adaptations. So uh, Richard Linklater is going to be making a uh, Merrily We Roll Along for the screen with uh, Beanie Feldstein, who is in Booksmart and Lady Bird. Uh, uh, what is that one? Um Neighbors to Sorority Rising. She's oh. <laughs> amazing. She's incredible. And uh, as the production, well, the the show itself takes place over the span of 20 years, this will be a boyhood situation. Well, it's unconfirmed, but it will likely be a 20-year production. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Merrily We Roll Along, and and I know some of you are, especially if you're one of my friends from college who was in um, a quite excellent Go Scarlet Knights production. Yeah. No, Cabaret Theater, Rutgers University. Um, are you rah rah? Are you rah rah? Who rah who rah? Rutgers rah. That's right. Yeah. Red team upstream, upstream, red team. Yeah. Anyway. Um, anyway. So, <laughs> Merrily We Roll Along is a musical that was um, written and developed by Stephen Sondheim. I forget who he collaborated with on it, but it's right. It takes place over the course of 20 years. It, it, it kind of, it's got a funky timeline. I think it goes um, back backwards. Um, <laughs> so, oh, yeah. I think it kind of starts at the, you know, um, 
if I if I remember correctly. But um, you know, it's like many Stephen Sondheim shows. It's it's got um, you know some really challenging songs. They're not songs that you're easily going to hum in the shower, um, but some really memorable characters and stories. And it's really about just these three, like creative people and these friends and their art and how their friendship and their art intertwine. Hmm. So well, Richard Link, so Richard Linkletter is going to spend the next 20 years making it. I believe so. At least that's the, the rumor right now. And Beanie and Beanie Feldstein, uh, was on Broadway in, I believe, hello, Dolly. Oh, so not in, out of this, you know, it, it's not an outrageous choice to play the character. So, Right. I'm looking forward to it. Um, 20 years from now. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's okay. it. For the, that's it for news stuff. Yeah. Not, not really. I know that there's been a bunch going on at like the, the, the Disney convention and they've been unveiling all sorts there's of. So there's so many things. There's like too much to even talk about. I saw a fantastic four reboot uh, possibly. And that's one that I hear. Uh, speaking of studio interference uh, hurting a film, yeah. that's the rumor is that it was not what it ended up being. Yeah, it, it I've, was I've, the, yeah. the 2015 one, right? The, right, yeah. Yeah. Now, I will say for Fantastic Four, I saw the you know, the original, not the whatever, like low budget Fantastic Four movie, but I saw the one Mm -hmm. with, um, Chris Evans and, um, yeah, Chris Evans is human torch and, um, Michael Chiklis, Michael Chiklis, Michael Chiklis was a great choice as the thing. And he was, I mean, he, I remember liking him a lot in that, um, and the villain was played by, oh man, yeah, I am drawing a blank on his name. He was on Nip Talk. Oh, um, I don't know. Um, well, anyway. Anyway, he was Victor Von Doom and I thought he was really good and I felt like he, they deserved a better kind of a, a you know, a, more of a chance, we'll say. Well, I so. mean, those movies were made before it was a super popular thing to be doing comic book. I mean, there were comic book movies at the time, but is they just pre what they Marvel, are now. Pre Marvel universe. Julian McMahon. There you go. Julian McMahon is who I'm, I'm thinking of a very excellent Dr. Doom and, or I thought so at least, I don't know. I'm sure there's comic book enthusiasts out there who are like, how dare you? Um, <laughs> well, that's how yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's smart to, to revive that, concept but i don't know i I know some people have fatigue for these things and i'm just like all right yeah keep making them it's giving people jobs and yeah uh, and that's cool i mean look i'll tell because i'm one of those people who's got a little fatigue and i'll just tell you i'll just you know i just kind of stopped going to see them for a little while like yeah, that's well, it that's all you need to do if you're fatigued by it is to, like you know they can still be made <laughs> yeah uh, and they still will be made um we're, we're gonna have another batman hey you know yeah uh hey did you watch the uh joker trailer that came out and no i had every intention of doing so today and it did not happen but i'm i'm getting more and more excited for this movie i think it's i think it's gonna be good I'm ex- I'm really looking forward to it. The more and more I see of it, the more distri- distinction I think um, Todd Phillips and Joaquin Phoenix are drawing between this Joker and kind of the the, the Joker. And I know like there's Jack Nicholson and Heath Ledger, their Jared Leto and Cesar Romero, and all their performances were different, but I feel like they're really making it clear that like, okay, this is not, and I'm sure there's like some Batman involvement in this somehow, like some references to whatever, like the Wayne corporation or Gotham city. But I feel like they're really doing everything they can to have this, um, story and this character stand on their own. Right. Yeah. Movies called Joker, not Joker, October 4th, Not Batman's, bad guy uh speaking of bad guys 
Transylvania 6 5000, a movie that was created because they wanted to have a movie that had a bunch of the, you know, monsters in it, like the universal monsters. monsters. But uh, we we also have the Monster Squad, which truly does have the uh, the universal monsters in it. This is a, um, you know, Rudy DeLuca, who is a protege of Mel Brooks. Um, he wrote, I think, High Anxiety and Life Stinks. Silent, and silent, yeah, um, actually, silent Life movie. Stinks, I think, was um, uh, <laughs> the other guy on the... Um, what do we call it? Oh, on, on the commentary. On the, on the commentary track. I, I <laughs> yeah, that's his so. Name. Um, yeah, it's you know he had done the, I think some of the Mel Brooks movies that were. Uh, he wrote Silent I Movie. Silent Movie is maybe the one standout, but some of the other ones that people like to forget. <laughs> uh, but uh, in, I think they wait. Did he do Dracula Dead and Loving It, or was that the other guy who was on the commentary? Oh, that was that was the other guy. And yeah. so, that, so this is Rudy DeLuca's um, first direct, um, direct. It's his direct directorial debut on a feature film. He had done television mm-hmm. before, and I, I, I read. I think it was on IMDb, uh, and I don't know how true this is, but one of the reasons why it was made is because. Uh, the Dow Chemical Corporation had frozen assets in Yugoslavia <laughs> that they needed to spend yep. there, so they made this this movie using those uh, funds. I don't know how true that is, but it's interesting. It, I I think it's I, I I mean I'm pretty sure it makes sense. <laughs> Let's put it this way: it, yeah. it makes sense. And um, it's this Steve Haberman. That, so, Steve, sorry, Steve, Steve Haberman, Haberman. Uh, who was the um, visual consultant on Transylvania 65000, one of the few Americans working on the film uh, that wasn't in the cast. And um, he also, right, he he did Dr- Dracula Dead and Loving It, um, Life Stinks. Yeah, so I mean, so the commentary a trek on this one was interesting, not in that uh, I learned anything from it necessarily. Um, maybe I learned which of the actors in it were people that were from this village in Yugoslavia <laughs> who had to learn their lines phonetically because they didn't know English at all. Yeah. Answer uh, most of them. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that was interesting. I, um, I thought really interesting. And I, I mean, I think kind of impressive in a few cases and a few instances. Well, yeah. Also, uh, I think especially the contortionist, the creature. I don't know, even know what you'd call him. Yeah, he yeah. is great. The, um, the, the little girl, Laura. Is the little girl, yeah. I was very surprised that she was, you know, one of those people. But makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, the commentary track for this movie actually made me want there to be a, like, either a documentary or like a docudrama about the making of this movie. Uh-huh. Like, I... I think it would be really funny to see a movie about the making of this movie. I I mean, yeah, of course we would want to see that because this is a movie we did grow up with. This is a movie that we've rewatched thousands of times. Yeah, but I'm like, I don't, I, I, I'm not sitting here thinking, oh man, I'd really like to see a movie about the making of Police Academy 4. Like, so you'd kind no. of like to see a disaster artist uh, version of this. I mean, kind of a disaster artist, but more of just a like Rudy DeLuca who just, who like, you know, just sat back and and watched like, you know, Mel Brooks make all these movies with this budget. And now he gets to make a movie, but he's with this indie company, uh, yeah. new world pictures who I had a dream not too long ago that, a uh, new world, someone, a scout from new world pictures saw me in a theatrical production and wanted to <laughs> sign me to their, to be in <laughs> new world pictures. Um, but anyway, um, so what a and, truly he, on brand dream. <laughs> and he's got this, he's like Rudy DeLuca. Just from, uh, you know, listening to him, I'm imagining this guy trying to direct a movie and he's like, he's a comedian and he's, his voice, his voice sounds exactly how you think it would sound. 
That's yeah. all I'll say. Yeah, and he's um I I don't know um you know where he's where he's from, but I, I'm imagining he's from New York and yeah. he His um, name is Rudy DeLuca and he talks like this and he, you know, wants to make this movie in Transylvania in Yugoslavia, you know, in this, yeah. this beautiful little town. It's a, it's a beautiful town. Nobody spoke a word of English. And they yeah. didn't, yeah. The movie didn't, I wanted it to come out before Halloween. It came out after Halloween. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's, he, at a few points, he gets a little, like, too defensive about it. It's like, right. it's still. So it's uh, just to give everybody a quick little synopsis of Transylvania 65,000, uh, there are these two reporters from a tabloid magazine, uh, one of whom is the son of the guy who runs the newspaper, and the other one is the journalist that they hired to uh, give them some uh Try to make it a more respectable newspaper, yeah, to give it some credibility. And so he's like a true journalist. The other one is kind of a dope. Um, so that's Jeff Goldblum, the credible journalist, and Ed Bailey Jr., uh, who plays the uh, the son, Gil. And the two of them are sent off to Transylvania because there was this tape that was sent in called Frankenstein Lives about this guy who's just poking around in some weird old abandoned church in the middle of Transylvania and a monster grabs him. What's up? I should note that it's not a, like it's, it's funny because it's titled like it's some type of like B movie, but it's really just these guys who are on vacation. It's, it's a yeah, found the camcorder. It's like, it's like, um, you know, the concept of Blair witch project. Yeah. 14 Pretty years. Pretty much earlier yeah so and, uh yeah. and the the guy in the video who i always thought was michael mckeon but it turns out it's not just somebody who looks exactly like him <laughs> right doesn't he look so much like him i i i've never noticed that i will oh. check it out he looks a lot like him uh but anyway so they go off to transylvania to um to find this frankenstein monster and they basically get like laughed at by everybody. They're staying in this uh, <laughs> old castle that's been converted into a hotel that is um, all done up in like creepy old laboratory <laughs> everything and like monsters. It's kind of the theme to uh, pay homage to the lore of Transylvania. And that hotel is run by the mayor of Transylvania, who is uh, played by Jeffrey Jones, who unfortunately uh, I have trouble watching now. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. He's uh, yeah, not he's a good guy. Checkered, checkered, checkered past there. Yeah. Uh, was in some great movies, had some great performances, but not, not an okay person. So I... Uh, yeah, they're staying there, and then as they're trying to investigate all of this stuff that's happening, uh, and everyone's just kind of laughing at them, they they unravel the whole thing and ultimately uh, reveal to the town some of the people who, I guess, are benefiting from this one doctor who lost his license, Dr. Malavakwa, his, some of his uh, out-of-the-ordinary experiments that have all actually been working out. So there, there mm -hmm. is somebody who uh, appears to be a werewolf, but he just has a very rare condition where he grows hair all over his body and face uh, that he's been treating. There's somebody who's been getting like crazy reconstructive surgery who is essentially a mummy. Um, there's a contortionist, but he's really just a contortionist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, I have a feeling and they didn't actually say this in the commentary, but I feel like it was maybe supposed to be the creature from the Black Lagoon or yeah, something because he like that. appears first in a lagoon. Yeah, except then yeah. he's just a guy wearing a unitard. I feel like maybe they didn't they couldn't get the costume. I mean, the way that they explain his role Couldn't in the commentary the costume, maybe. is, yeah, he was this contortionist, so uh, yeah, we'll put him in the movie. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? I never thought twice about it, but it's like, No, sure. me neither. Uh, there is these, this Frankenstein's monster character, um, 
I feel like the reason why he is the way he is kind of always just, you know, I don't think there's really a good reason, but they, ex- you got to have him. They explain, I think they explain it, but yeah, I yeah. cannot. And then uh, Gina Davis in her first film. No, no. One of her uh, first films. Tootsie, Tootsie was her first. Oh, right. Tootsie. So yeah. in one of her first films, I should say, uh, plays this nymphomaniac uh, vampirus that uh, <laughs> is, I don't know if there's a real medical reason why she's with Dr. Malavakwa, but she is. And Dr. Malavakwa is played by uh, Joe, Joe Bologna. Yeah. You might know, you, you might remember him as Adam Sandler's father and Big Daddy. Sure. Sure. I can't think of any of his other, he was in Blame It on Rio, I think with Michael Caine. All right. So yeah, uh, so, um, she, so Gina Davis, uh, tr- did Transylvania 65,000 actually came out the same year as Fletch. Um, oh. I think it actually came out after Fletch. So she would have been, had just been in Fletch. Yeah. Um, but other than Tootsie, she'd been doing TV up until, up until yeah. that point. And this is the film where she, met her eventual husband and then eventual ex-husband, Jeff Goldblum. Her future who ex-husband. <laughs> who then went on to, you know, they did the fly together and then Earth Girls Are Easy. And yeah, um, yeah, they were, they were great. And yeah. So just running down the cast really quickly, we've already talked about Ed Bagley Jr., Jeff Goldblum, Gina Davis, Jeffrey Jones. Uh, so the, there's this, these two, butlers at the mansion um who are played by uh, carol kane who's absolutely amazing and yeah. um john biner as radu and uh he's you know just a comedy guy and his whole thing is that he doesn't know how to not be a servant to people he is kind of the Igor of the movie. He's just kind of, he calls everybody master. And when he is told not to call someone master, he like can't get the word, like their name out of his mouth. It's so good. When he does, it's awkward. And the, yeah. And then Carol Kane, um, who plays Loopy is, uh, Radu's wife. And she is, is even more subservient also to Radu but he can't handle having someone under him. It's like their dynamic is just so wonderful. I love it. It's it's really funny. Yeah. And John Biner is, I mean, I I couldn't tell you another movie he's in, but I remember John Biner from like watching in the 80s, watching like Hollywood Squares. When oh, it was okay. like John Davidson was the host. So anyone else who's old like me, um, might remember, you know, it was like Joan Rivers was Jim J. Mm-hmm. Bullock. Um, but I remember John Biner was always on there and he'd always do impressions and, and voices oh, yeah. and everything. So I feel like a lot of his act ended up in this movie. Oh yeah. I, I remembered in the commentary, like he does this little tiny squeaky voice in it. And I had no idea that was just part of, it's like one of his little sticky things that he does. Yeah. Um, well, I always and- thought it was a quirk of the character. <laughs> And speaking of shtick, <laughs> Michael Richards, Michael uh, Richards, <laughs> Michael another... Richards, who, I mean, was he on Fridays at this point? Fridays would have been before this. So like right I before think. this. Um, yeah. Yeah. So he is the, I guess, general gopher person, bellhop at the, uh, at the hotel. And it, <laughs> this this I did find interesting. I guess they just went to a department store and he bought all of these weird props and used them throughout <laughs> the movie. And when you watch the movie, you're just like, that's a really random thing to be happening. And that's really quirky. And I never thought twice about it. But then knowing that he just went to a department store and bought like mannequin parts and a little child's riding toy. And what's up? And you know it's it's so funny because there's something what he does um I think it's when he first meets um at Beckley oh, with the Jr. Little puppet with the little puppet with the little yeah. doll and I I feel like growing up watching it I was always just like 
what i was confused and but right i didn't exactly question i was just like oh, all right that guy does some weird stuff and what's funny is listening to the commentary track they didn't get it either <laughs> rudy, yeah rudy jaluk was like i don't know what he was doing he had a doll yeah but it was sorry it's funny. rudy jaluk just, and not bernie sanders um eh. but it's it is funny. It's just funny to watch him do these super weird things. He's so consistently random and and weird. And he's always trying to like he's just always trying to get a laugh. Yeah, he's he's always and he's really he wants Gil to really uh, at Begley Jr. He yeah. really wants Gil to appreciate his humor. Right. So there's the the moment when he's uh, Gil's going outside and he's like, hey, wait, 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 wait. And he just makes him watch him slip on a <laughs> banana peel. <laughs> and it's just this like dumb nothing moment, but it's just funny. And the way he falls, it's perfect. It's perfect. He like drops it on the ground and then he goes, it's a beautiful day today. And then just slips on it. And I have thought about this and I've always been considering, not always, but <laughs> the past you know, 10 years been considering a Transylvania 65,000 tattoo. And the only one I can really think of is like a banana peel that says it's a beautiful day today. <laughs> That's the only one I can really think of. I love it. I, su- I, I support it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah. so Michael Richards just plays this guy who's just a complete goofball weirdo. Um, and I will say that, I did have an opportunity to talk with Ed Bigley Jr. a few years back, and right. I told him how much this movie means to us, and he was very appreciative of hearing that. He um, <laughs> did not say, like, he did not scoff and say, like, oh, that dumb movie. Like, he truly, you know, has fondness for all of the work he's done, and he has done so much work. He that man appar- is in everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, and you know what? Um, I should point out that the actor who plays the, you know, the wolf man who turns out to just be this Donald guy. Donald Gibb. Donald Gibb, uh, who um, fans of Revenge of the Nerds would know as Ogre. That's Ogre. Yeah. Yeah. Ogre. Donald Gibb. Wait a second. I need to uh, look up something about him. That might come up later. Um, but oh, anyway... Yeah. Uh, and then Teresa, is it Teresa Ganzel? Teresa Ganzel. Teresa plays- Ganzel. She plays Jeff Goldblum's love interest. And uh, I always remember her also from being in The Toy. Oh, right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So Teresa Ganz, so. Uh, Which is a I- very bizarre movie. I should, uh, yeah, um, I should note that my, um, the case of my DVD of Transylvania 65,000 is autographed by Teresa Ganzel. What? Did I never tell you the story about how I met Teresa Ganzel? I'll have to find the the photos. I'll have to find the photos somewhere. So, all right, a little, little, um, I guess family history, a little family information. So, um, a cousin, uh, first cousin of our mothers, um, was married to, uh, a producer and, uh, you know, he produced, uh, he had pr- produced things for TV, for theater, and he produced a, he produced a show in, I don't know if it was like 2009, 2010, like it was, you oh, know, Viagra Falls. Viagra Falls. Yes. Thank you. I'm glad you remembered the, I, I, I was trying so much to, I was trying so hard to remember the name. So it, it oh, was, how could you forget it? It was, it was written. Um, it was written by the actor. Oh man. Why am I drawing a blank on his name? Um, but he was the, the amazing Larry in, um, oh, oh yeah. Luke, Luke Cattell. It was Luke Cattell and Bernie Coppell, Doc from The Love Boat, who mm-hmm. were playing these two guys who, like, like basically call uh, an escort. And, you know, it's lots of, like, old, like, horny old guy jokes. And Teresa right. Genzel plays the escort. So, Oh, that's so um, funny. But, yeah, The Amazing Larry from Pee-wee's Big Adventure, Doc from The Love Boat, and Teresa Genzel. Elizabeth. From Transylvania 65,000. 
Indeed. So yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I told her a Who's, similar thing about how much I enjoyed the movie, and she, you know, that is too funny. I uh, and her main character trait that you find out kind of later, but then really <laughs> is repeated is uh, her tendency to break bottles and threaten people with them and <laughs> cut people with broken bottles. Like that's like her thing. Yeah. It it is established. I don't know. I wonder I don't know if that was like a character trait that she was like into beforehand or if it's just like something that cuz it comes up in the like the date that she has with Jeff Goldblum's character and then oh, later yeah. on she threatens somebody with a broken bottle and says, "You want to eat some glass?" Doesn't she t- That's right. It's very <laughs> quotable. Um yeah, I think isn't she talking about like her ex-husband how she mm-hmm. like hit her ex-husband over that with a wine bottle or something? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then he kind of like takes the wine bottle and like moves it away from her. <laughs> well, something something also uh that's interesting about this movie is that it really only takes place over the course of 2 days. There's they get there. There's the the overnight sequence where Odette, Gina Davis's character, first encounters Gil, and then there's the entire uh-huh. next day when everything else happens. Oh yeah. Good point. I always thought that it took place over like a, a, at least a week. And then I think not this past time I watched it, but the time before I was like, this really only takes place over like two days, not counting the first scene where they're uh, getting their assignment and then traveling Richard, to Transylvania. It, Richard Linklater would make the movie in two days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That'd be his fastest production yet. Um, oh, and uh, the owner of the newspaper, Norman Fell. Oh, right. Yes. Mr. Roper from Three's Company. So So, uh, one thing that they keep on talking about in the commentary is how tall the cast is. Everybody's like at least six, four. Goldblum, Uh, Begley, Michael Richards, Gina Gina Davis. Davis, Yeah. Jeffrey Jones. Tall guy. So um, anyway, yeah, this movie is bonkers. Uh, it, there's a reason why we keep on revisiting it and remember it so fondly. And it's not just because it was always playing like on HBO or whatever. Like there's a reason why we would always watch this and remember all these things about it. It's just that kind of movie. It's and fun. It's fun. It's bizarre. And the things that you remember aren't necessarily the things that have anything to do with the plot or whatever. Like Dr. Malavacqua has this character quirk. And that's, I think what this movie has is character quirks yes. where when he goes into like, he's completely normal and like a polite guy. But as soon as he steps foot into his laboratory, mm. like he, his hair gets all crazy and he becomes this like tyrant to, uh, the mad to Radu and Loopy. He's a mad scientist. Uh, it's like a Jekyll and Hyde thing he's got going on. Exactly. But as soon as he steps through that threshold back, he's like the nicest guy. He's like, why are you working so hard? Have Take a break. Yeah. Take a break. Sit down. Have an espresso. Have an espresso. That was his big thing is the espresso. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, there's Everybody's got these weird character quirks. Even when they first go to that one hotel and they're asking about Frankenstein and there's oh. all the different people who work there, the way that they all laugh at the concept of like asking about Frankenstein. The laugh that one, the girl, with the, <laughs> yeah. And the rhythm of the laughs, the syncopation of the laughs in that scene. It's, oh. it's, those are the things that are memorable, memorable about this movie. Yeah. And it's funny because in the commentary, th- you know, Rudy DeLuca is like, oh yeah, the the ghost of Estee Lauder or whatever it is. He's like, that's the best joke in the movie. And it's like, I've never even remembered that joke a second after they said it. Like, I it's remember not, it. It's not the best joke in the movie. <laughs> no. It, and it's like, it doesn't have staying power. Like, that's not something that people today would necessarily think is really funny. But it's no. those character quirks that always are good. I mean, what would you say now? It's the Phantom of Sephora. I don't know. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So, Dan, first I must ask yeah. you, do you remember the first time you saw this movie? I don't. I don't. But I can tell you that I remember, like, I remember seeing spots on TV for it. And I remember, like, they because they would show the 
um, the part where Ed Begley Jr. is uh, trying to get, I think this is where he's coming out of the, when he sneaks in and out of the asylum. And he's like up on that high wall and he's leaning on it, looking like he's standing, but his feet are like six feet off the ground. And like the two old women pass by. I remember that being in the commercial. I remember thinking that was hilarious. I was What a weird thing to put in the ad for it. I don't know. I mean, totally out of context, but I don't know. I just thought it was funny. And uh, I don't remember it playing anywhere really near. Like, I don't remember it being in the theater. I remember that it came out in theaters, but I think the first time seeing it would have been either renting it on VHS or taping it. I know I'm. I'm pretty sure I taped it off HBO. Like I had a, a, a VHS tape taped I'm off HBO. I'm pretty sure I can picture exactly what the blank tape with it. The masking on tape. It. Yeah. It had, yeah, it was, I didn't have a label. There's masking tape. Oh yeah. I remember that one very clearly. Yeah. Um, by the way, we didn't mention this earlier and I'm so sorry I didn't, but, uh, and if, and if you'd follow us on Instagram, you've already, been made aware of this, but the often mentioned Rialto Theater in Westfield, New Jersey, where Dan has seen so many of these movies. I know I've also seen a ton of oh, movies too. And it's yeah, it's closing. Well, and, well, and it's closed. And I know that we forgot. Oh, it's closed. We forgot to mention. Right. I want to finish talking about Transylvania Six Five Thousand, oh, but I, I did done. actually, I did actually want to bring, um, I did actually want to bring that up because. Uh, I I have prepared a little tribute. I kind of combed the banks and I I wrote down every movie that I remember seeing there. And like I had to like look through the internet and be like, all right, what movies came out in 1990? And I was like, oh yeah, I saw that there. But uh, <laughs> after after we've said all there is to say about Transylvania Six Five Thousand, I will go through. I've I've been trying to put together a collage of the posters, but been having a little trouble uh doing that and finding time as i'm prepping Mm -hmm. for the uh the school year but um so back to transylvania 6 5000 john um i I, i'm curious to know um and i imagine your first time seeing it was with me at that like i don't know probably the same first time i had seeing it so what i mean what do you think like is there any type of like new life for this movie is there a new world for this new world picture First of all, jeez. Oh First of all, I know that this would never, ever, ever happen. But <laughs> this is what I would like to happen. I mean, I, I think that your idea is funny. A movie about the making of this movie in this weird, bizarre little town in Yugoslavia. Um, but I would love to see a sequel with, uh, I'd say, most of the original cast, as uh, certain ones have either past or uh shouldn't be allowed in movies anymore jeffrey jones uh but you know getting like the main group back together goldblum uh, begley davis and i know that michael richards has been you know a little iffy but uh yeah yeah he's not on the same naughty list as jeffrey jones but no 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 um and to that i will say Google it if you don't know what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, so I'd love to see a sequel. They get back together. Uh, perhaps there is a Transylvanian mystery and like something is going on in the town and they don't know what to do. But then they remember these two American journalists who came back in the 80s and uh, <laughs> uncovered this huge mystery in the town and they have them come to figure it out. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just think it'd be so great to get them back. To, and also it's just like Jeff Goldblum and Ed Bakley Jr. Are some of <laughs> Ed Bakley Jr. is probably one of the most prolific actors there is right now. I put on any show anymore and he's in it in some way. Yeah. Jeff Goldblum, did you see the clip of him when they were talking, when like somebody was asking him about Spider-Man going from Marvel to back to Sony? Wait, who, Jeff Goldblum? Yeah, there's this real, yeah, somebody was interviewing him on a red carpet and you have to watch it. It's so funny, but. 
<laughs> it's kind of like, is Jeff Goldblum from outer space? Like, what is going on? The way that he reacts to hearing all this stuff happen. Oh, because he has and, that sh- the show on Disney Plus that he's doing, like, well, the world I mean, of Goldblum he, or something like that. Right, but he's also in the Thor universe. So oh, he's, that's right. Yeah. He's... Him in uh, in Thor Ragnarok is perfection. It's so good. I like him very much. I I have some challenges with that movie, but do you really? Interesting. Yeah, I well, yeah no. I just it's. I mean, it's just one of those things. It's just not one of those movies that has clicked with me. Oh okay. Um, well, I, he I and you I, are th- birthday buddies, so there's that. That's right. Yeah, us and and uh, Zach Hansen of the band Hansen. There you go. And anyone else born on October twenty second. Yeah. can be our birthday buddies. Um, so I, my idea is a little different. Um, it's a remake. Oh, and, one, oh, one, one other yeah, thing oh, is ooh. I also wouldn't be opposed to a stage adaptation, perhaps a musical. Of course. Yeah. It would have to because be Because it, it would, it would work. It'd be, it would work so well. Anyway, go on. Um, yeah. So, I'm seeing a remake and here's, so here's your, here's your kind of your, your setup, your, your scenario is that you there, you've, you've got uh, this doctor, Dr. Malavacqua, who treats patients with both with severe um, physical afflictions that also have, um, you know, like that, that, there's mental, there's mental illness. There's, um, you know, some mental illness, but it's interactive with a physical disability. Like, you know, like the Wolfman who grows, he doesn't have a disability, but he has hair that grows all over his body. So he believes that he should not like, you know, he becomes a, a shut in. He becomes a, um, you know, he's, a, he's afraid of, go, of, of going out. He's afraid of being outdoors. I'm, I'm trying to think of the word of when you're afraid of crowds. Agoraphobic. Thank you. Um, so, so you have this, this, um, this doctor who treats, um, you know, who treats his people. He, he likes to do experimental treatment and, you know, like Dr. Melavacqua in, in, as Joseph Bologna plays him, you know, it's, he's got these crazy out there tactics, but they work. Um, it's actually what he does on the Wolfman is electrolysis. So it's not that crazy, but, um, I want to add the psychological element to it of like, where maybe Dr. Malavacqua is, he's a psychiatrist and he's also a, a, you know, physical doctor, a general practitioner. So he, um, and he finds that he's not, you know, he's kind of an outcast of the, the medical and psychiatric community. Um, and what he does is he there, he buys, there's a castle for sale in Eastern Europe and he buys this castle and basically he finds ways to take his, these patients and adapt they're take what's hold what they feel is holding them back or what's causing them to hold themselves back and make it something that puts them out there. So he buys this hotel to theme it as like this, you know, universal monsters or, you know, if universal makes the movie, they could call it that, but like, you know, they, they have it themed to, to be, you know, a tribute to all of the great, you know, monster, uh, movies and legends, the yeah. classic monsters. And, and it's like, they're the staff of the hotel or like they're role players who, you know, who interact with the guests. Wait a second. I haven't seen it, but is this the plot of hotel Transylvania? No, I think in hotel Transylvania, they're actually monsters. It might, I haven't seen hotel oh, Transylvania. Right, either. Right, right. No, but so then, so, well, okay. So f- you have that aspect and it, it appeals to cosplayers and it's, you know, it's kind of a place where it's like, Hey, you know, if you're into, you know, monster movie cosplay, you know, if you come stay at this hotel, you get the full experience. Like you're not just wearing a costume. You're in, you're in it. And, 
um, you know, and he's got like, you know, he doesn't have to hire someone to do Wolfman makeup or costume because he's got someone who's just going to, you know, play the Wolfman. And, um, you know, maybe you've got like a couple of bloggers who come and check it out or we call them influencers, like, Dan, a couple of, in- yeah, no, but that like, let's say you've got a podcasters, a, perhaps <laughs> couple of podcasters, uh, but yeah, it could be any of those who decide like, oh man, all right, we're going to go and like, we're going to like get to the bottom of this. Like what's, you know, what is it? And I also would integrate a little bit of a movie here called High Spirits, which was uh, Neil Jordan directed in 1988, uh, Peter O'Toole, um, Steve Gutenberg, Daryl Hannah about like a hotel that was haunted. It's a little bit more similar, I'd say, to that plot. Um, but it incorporates these monsters who or these, sorry, not monsters, but pe- you know, the, these people, these patients who for one reason or another have withdrawn from society and by bringing cosplayers, people who, you know, generally speaking, you know, live, you know, live normal lives and, you know, live. And if you um, listen to the last episode of this podcast in our interview yeah. with Faye Merman, you'll know exactly, exactly what we're talking, the pool guy. Well, exactly. It was when I listened to Faye's, you know, and that I was like, yeah, no, this is like Transylvania, what I'm thinking for Transylvania 65,000. Sure. And it, that appeal in saying, and for this doctor to say, well, if we bring this portion of the world in, and it's kind of like not just saying, it's not necessarily, so like the usual message is like, hey, rest of the world, these are people just like you. They just have problems that are slightly different. It's almost like saying, hey, people who think, who feel like you're so different, you're really not. And like that, you know, there are people out there who spend a lot of money to be, to be different, to gain differences. There are people who envy that. And I don't know. I think it would be, I I think it could, you know, I think it could have potential. I also feel like there's gotta be something about like the, the lab is, is haunted. Like maybe Dr. Melavacqua is like, all right, well, I need an office where I can like actually practice psychiatry and medicine, but, but that's not easy to find. So, you know, of course there's hidden passages in, in the castle and there's, and he like takes the lab and converts it into his like office. But I, I like keeping the whole bit about where it's haunted and he becomes the mad scientist. <laughs> so it's kind of like, so it, it, so then it, it also gives you the opportunity to have this doctor who, I mean, even though all of the quote unquote monsters are really, are just like kind of, you know, regular people who are working through some things, the doctor who's supposed to be, you know, the one kind of in control he, you know, gets whatever possessed by the ghost in, in the lab. And so then that kind of there gives you the conflict, the drama and how the the patients kind of now need to work with the guests and be like, all right, there's a crazy guy on the loose. And like, you know, maybe they make they try to make all the guests think like, hey, no, this is just part of the experience. The mad scientist Uh who's on the loose and he's trying to find brains for, you know. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So less of a remake and more of a in the world of um, inspired by... Well, it's a, a revision. I, I a mean, revision. I would, it's a well. I mean, because it's still so you're keeping the fact that you're you're keeping the like Transylvania themed hotel. Sure, you're keeping the idea of a doctor um, with patients with very unique needs and right. trying to help the, those people in whatever way, shape, or form, and you're. You're still talking, I think you still have that element or you could still have that element of the two, you know, people who are like, all right, something's not a hundred, like something's not kosher here. 
what is it? And you could have the skeptic and you could, uh, the, the skeptic who's just like, no, it's just, they must have a really, really, really good makeup person. Like, well, what if it was, um, just to bounce, to spit all this a little bit, uh, what if it was journalists who have lost their jobs because of, you know, print media kind of going oh. away and they've become travel writers because that's <laughs> what they could get. And so they are going to write about Eastern Europe and they find themselves at this hotel and their like journalistic tendencies kick in. Yeah. So maybe, yeah. Oh, I like that idea because, because I don't know that you necessarily need the whole like um, Frankenstein terrorizing the, the town. I mean, you could replace that with Dr. Bellavacqua (laughs) terrorizing the town and looking for brains. (laughs) Right. Or something else. It doesn't have to be brains. That's just what comes to mind. You know, the important thing to remember (laughs) is that, None of these things will ever happen. <laughs> no one cares about this world as much as we do. <laughs> I, you know, you're right. You're right. But I think it's, I, and I think this is one of the things that I love most about doing this podcast is taking that moment and saying like, well, what if, what, like, what could yeah. you actually just taking the challenge of saying like, all right, Transylvania six, 5,000, what could you do with that? And then realizing like, Hey, that you could actually do something that, that could potentially even improve upon the, the original. I'm not saying my idea is better than well, the let original. Me, but. Well, let me tell you an idea that actually can happen Oh, is that our next big family trip is to this <laughs> tiny town in Yugoslavia. <laughs> yes. It's good, eh? Yeah, it's good. It's funny. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. It's good, eh? You like? <laughs> uh, this man is anyway. asking about Frankenstein. <laughs> 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 They're so good. Uh, anyway, um, so, so let's talk about what we're going to do on the next episode. Well, um, and, and then we'll do our tribute to the Rialto Theater. Yes. Um, so uh, it, in the spirit, it is uh, the end of summer. And as it is time to go back to school, there is no movie more appropriate for us to do than back to school. Yes. And uh, if anybody listened to our episode in so- about Soap Dish, uh, you've you've heard about my wife, Laura, and how she uh, kind of she's a very intelligent person, but when it comes to movies, it all goes out the window. And she was like, what's that movie where Roddy Dangerfield goes back to school? Oh, back to school. Um, but she said Rodney Dangerfield. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Uh, but this movie does star both Rodney Dangerfield and Robert Downey Jr. Or as we call them here on ruined childhoods, (laughs) Rodney Downey Jr. Jr. Field. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, and before you get into your Rialto list, which I'm sure is extensive, uh, <laughs> I, I, and this is something that we will post on our Instagram. I don't think we've done it yet, but, uh, the, at the midnight showing uh, opening night of star Wars episode one, the Phantom Menace, uh, our brother Scott and myself waited on the line, uh, the, the full story, we, we, we were waiting online at the Rialto Theater in Westfield. This was the night before you were supposed to graduate from college, but I believe there was a weather postponement. But yeah, it was, uh, yeah, there was my uh, college graduation was postponed today for weather. Yes, but uh, Scott and I were going to be taking that day off from school because we would be going to your graduation so we had arranged for this whole thing to go to the midnight showing of Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Uh, and then even though we found out that it was being postponed today, for some reason we still went and then went to school the next day as planned. Um, very tired, for sure, and disappointed. <laughs> um, but we, we made the 
uh, a segment on the channel New Jersey Network, New Jersey News, New Jersey channel Network. Channel 12. I think it's NJN. NJ12. NJN, yeah. Just, and NJN. Um, they did a news story about uh, Star Wars Mania because at that time nobody knew what to expect from the prequels. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Scott and uh. I, in different segments, in different B-roll shots, are featured in this. There's one moment where I am chanting the words Star Wars with a group of strangers. And then there is Scott wearing his Cranford, New Jersey high school band jacket, a borrowed Darth Vader helmet that he got from some <laughs> other person on the line, and lightsaber and was doing a jig in the middle of the street. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so uh, we'll have to post the video of that. I think that our friend Jeff Rubin uh, tracked down the or had the VHS somewhere and probably transferred it to, uh, to digital in a very crappy quality. Episode one. I feel like yeah. episode one is, is the movie that really kind of put the Rune Childhood's movement in into play. It's true. Yeah. I mean, like, I'm sure there were some childhoods ruined by, like, the uh, Car 54 Where Are You movie, but I think Star Wars episode <laughs> one was the one that really popularized that phrase. Um, so... My my memories of the Rialto. Do we need to play uh, some like really dramatic music during this? Uh, it's Sarah McLaughlin. I will remember you, of course. Okay, um, great. No, <laughs> I don't. I I leave it to you. You are the wizard of post production. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I I know I went to the Rialto a lot, and I know that my list does not have every movie that I've seen there, but um, I like in high school would go with friends, you know, on, on weekends and, you know, but when we were kids, we would go. So in fact, and this was a topic of discussion in Hawaii because we saw, John saw his first movie in the, I actually, I don't know what my first movie in the theater was, but it was not follow that bird, which was John's first movie. That was mine, Mm -hmm. which we saw at the Rialto. So um, so I've got follow that bird. I am almost 100% positive that I saw return of the Jedi at the Rialto. Um, it not, perhaps not during the 83 release, but like when it was re-released in like 84 or 85, I might've seen it. I was young. Um, three amigos, mm-hmm. police Academy Four, citizens, City, on patrol. citizens, citizens, on patrol. city slickers, Sleeping with the Enemy, A Few Good Men, Mrs. Doubtfire. This is in no order, by the way. Yeah. Um, Lethal Weapon 4, Terminator 2. I remember seeing Lethal Weapon 4 in the theater because I was excited about it because Van Halen was on the soundtrack. It was with that the song year. Fire in the Hole. Yeah. Go on. Um, uh, so Lethal, I saw so Lethal it with Weapon Mark Sebaceous. Go oh, on. okay. Yeah, Mark Sebastian. I saw it with mom and dad at hmm. the Rialto. Uh, saw Terminator 2 there. Saw The Adventures of Ford Fairlane, starring Andrew Dice Clay. Yes. Uh, saw the X-Men, the, the 2000, the original uh, X-Men movie. Um, actually, funny story, that was when uh, Scott's, well, in both, both of your friend Eric Richardson was working mm-hmm. there. And yep. <laughs> when we went in and Eric Rich, I remember Eric Richardson telling us as we were going in, buying, buying our tickets and going in, he says, yeah, you got to check out Wolverine. Go check out Wolverine. I'm, I said, I'm going to check out the whole movie. <laughs> so um, saw that there. S- saw Gross Point Blank. Oh, that's a good one. Exorcist 3. Young Guns 2. Fahrenheit 9-11. Oh, um, Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, Big, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Philadelphia, The Crying Game, Moulin Rouge. Speaking of Neil Jordan. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, the Crying Game is one of my favorite movies. Uh, so I saw Moulin Rouge there the first time I saw it in the theater. Saw it twice in the theater. Uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which I'm pretty sure I saw there. There's a slight chance I saw it at the Montclair 
Claridge, but I'm pretty sure I saw it at the Rialto. I saw Alien 3 there. Saw Hot Shots and Hot Shots Part 2 there. Earth Girls Are Easy. Nice. Vice versa. Ooh. Speaking of checkered backgrounds, Leonard Part 6. Oh, man. You saw yeah. that in the theater? Whoa. I, I Yeah, I sure. Well, you know, what do you want? I was 11. Um, look Who's Talking. Boys Don't Cry, Dogma, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, Secret of the Ooze. Right. The Fisher King, another one of my favorites. That's one of my favorites. Speed, Naked Gun 2 and a Half, The Smell of Fear, My Cousin Vinny, School Ties. Whoa, School yeah. Ties. Uh, Mr. Saturday Night. Cliffhanger, Wolf, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Oh my God. And Desperado is the last one on my list. Oh my God. Some really interesting movies in this list. I, I, well, you know, it's like some of these are just like when I would just go to the movies and it was like, all right, well, what's going to appeal to an 11 year old? Okay, Leonard. Oh, shoot. You know what? I just remembered another one. As we're talking, Troop Beverly Hills. Oh, nice. And you know what else I saw at the Rialto? What? She's out of control. Nice. She, She's with Tony Danza. Yeah. Wow. And uh, Amy Dolan's daughter of Mickey Dolan's. How about that? Uh, b- before we quickly wrap up here, uh, I think it was in the last episode I had mentioned um, that there is probably a way to link every movie uh, within six degrees to Lorenzo's oil. Uh, I do want to <laughs> say Transylvania 65000 can be linked. Uh, Jeff Goldblum and Susan Sarandon were in Igby Goes Down together. Susan Sarandon is in Lorenzo's oil. So, Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Hold on. I, I didn't, I want to, I want to try this right now oh, okay. on the spot. <laughs> Um, to use it. You want to find a, a different, different link? That's all. I'm going to try to find, I'm going to try to find a, a different link here. So between Transylvania 65,000 and Lorenzo's oil, I'm doing this without looking up any of the cast, by the way. So I really don't remember who else was in Lorenzo's oil other than Nick Nolte and, and Susan Sarandon. So I feel like that's uh, really all you probably need. I mean, is it, is it cheating if I, if I look up the cast here? I mean, I'm going to tell you right now, the only, I don't know if anyone's really going to help you. Full uh, disclosure, I'm looking it up. All right. Margot um, Martindale, maybe. James Reborn, maybe. Oh, okay. So James, yeah. Um, so, yeah. No, okay. Um, all right. So, let's see. Transylvania 65000. Um, so, Gina Davis. Okay. One degree, Thelma and Louise, Gina Davis, Susan Sarandon. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, of course. <sighs> <laughs> and that's our oh, new segment, yeah. Six Degrees of Lorenzo's Oil. <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> what? Uh, we're we're going to have to do this every episode. <laughs> I'm down for it if you are. Six degrees of Lorenzo's oil, but I'm going to try to not think about it until we're recording. Yeah, I'm going to try to do that, that too. Way. Uh, all right. Anyway, so all right, next episode is going to be back to school. Uh, I'm so happy that we talked about Transylvania Six Five Thousand. I I watched the I watched it with the commentary while I was also uh, doing work, so I it was a nice <laughs> thing to do while accomplishing things. Um, I didn't need to necessarily watch it because I, it's so burnt into my brain. So right. always a good time. And I I'm felt, looking forward yeah, I, to, to rewatching Back to School. Yeah. Very, uh, very exciting. Great movie. Great cast. Uh, really great team behind it. So on that note, John, I good bid journey. you a good journey. <laughs>